Well, I want to share a few thoughts this morning, um, and it really didn't occur to me until after I had prepared the message and thought about this weekend and, and our recognition of Memorial Day that I, I, it's part of the series that Pastor Jake is preaching on, advancing the kingdom, and uh, his kingdom is the eternal kingdom. We live in this world and we have jobs, we have little, <clears throat> kind of little sub-kingdoms, and, and, but there, there is a big kingdom that you and I as believers have committed ourselves to. And I, I just want to encourage you with some reminders this morning. We live in an amazing time. We live in a time of such conflict and such acrimony that, that it's good to remind ourselves of, uh, of the fact that God is sitting on the throne and that he has a plan and that we're part of his plan. And it's, it's, um, it's exciting that way. So uh, a few reminders there. There's um, um, an idea that um, Scripture puts forth about you and me, that we are part of a story. Every single person in here, every single person alive <clears throat> is part of a narrative that God is telling. And God wants every living human being to step into that story and, and line up with his purposes for our lives. He wants each of you to line up with your purpose for your life that he has in mind and in his heart for you. And it's up to you to do that. It's up to you to surrender to him and say, yes, I want to be part of that story. Um, Paul writes to the Corinthians, those, the believers in Corinth, and he says, clearly you are a letter. He uses the word epistle. You are a letter of Christ written out, written not with ink, but by the spirit of the living God. You are a letter by the Spirit of God that's written by God, and your life is a story that fits into the big story of God. I, is that a cool thing? Say amen if you think that's a cool thing. I think it's a cool thing too. Amen to me. I have some ideas about that that I want to share with you this morning, and we're going to start with a story from Scripture that gives such a good picture of, and a framework for us um, um, to consider. And um, it's a, the picture of Babylon. There was a time in Israel's history where they won't, weren't obeying God, where they were rebelling against God and living in disobedience to God. And God has established this country as, or this nation, I should say, these people, as an object lesson throughout history for those who would commit themselves to him, how he would deal with them. And he kind of puts them forth and says, this is what it's all about. And he brought them forth in an age of many gods and many different um, practices, a lot of evils in a wicked, evil world. And <clears throat> so they weren't obeying God, so he sent them uh, in one of the situations into captivity to a nation called Babylon. And during that time, there are a number of prophets who wrote about what God was saying and speaking about their time there and about what God was wanting to accomplish. So this is from Jeremiah chapter 29, and I'm going to read several verses, but um, uh, just listen and get the full effect. Jeremiah was a prophet, and he was prophesying to the people of God who were going into captivity in Babylon. And he says now in, in uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the remainder of the elders who were carried away captive to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Verse 4, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away. So these are the people carried away and in captivity, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. These are my instructions to you. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and have sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive, and pray to the Lord for it, for in its peace you will have peace. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you nor listen to your dreams which you cause to be dreamed. For they prophesy falsely to you in my name. 
I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word toward you and cause you to return to this place, to Jerusalem. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call on me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you to the place from which I have caused you to be carried away captive. Praise God. From this, we're going to consider some big ideas, some main ideas. Idea number one, for, and, and again, I hope that as you heard that, that you drew that comparison of Israel being in captivity in Babylon to a comparison of us in our world. This is not our home. We were bought with a price. We are now citizens of heaven, another world, a different world. And in bringing the kingdom, we are called to bring the kingdom of heaven to this world. <clears throat> and in that, we parallel the instructions of the prophet Jeremiah to the people. Have kids, raise families, do business, uh, 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 um, infiltrate, I, 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 I was going to say integrate, but that's not wrong. Infiltrate the world that you're in and bring your world, the kingdom of God, into the world that you're in. Right. Amen? This is the this is the idea today that I want to bring forth to you uh, of us doing that. And I'm going to give it to you in, in pieces and ideas that every one of us can embrace. First of all, keep the end in sight. Keep the end in sight. One of the most powerful things about that captivity is that God made it clear to them through the prophet how long it would last. Now, how many of you in your Christian walk uh, are, are the most frustrating thing is you don't really know what God's going to do next. I mean, he says to your heart he's going to do this, but you don't know how he's going to do it or, 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 or whatever. So you wring your hands. And oftentimes, and we have plenty of scriptural examples, oftentimes we get out ahead of God. And in fact, sometimes we get off the path of what God has intended because we get anxious or we do things for God. <clears throat> But God made it clear to them that it was going to be 70 years after. Now, he was a little vague about what he was going to do after 70 years exactly. But he was, the captivity was going to be completed after 70 years. And I'll tell you, if I was in that captivity, that would give me great confidence to live the way I was supposed to live. I know that he's in control. He's got us here. He knows how long we're going to be here. And he has something in mind in the purpose of this. The purpose is for us to come to our senses and then, again, be obedient to God. But it's also for us to influence the Babylonians, influence those around us. Those are the two purposes. But he has, <clears throat> he has a beginning. This is the beginning of the captivity. And he has the end in mind, too. So this example for us is the same for us in this world. He has an end in mind. And, and, and Scripture is very clear uh, in God's redemption story, the resurrection of Christ and the promise from Romans 14, 11, says, every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Now, if you were in Babylon and you knew that God was in control and you knew he had you there exactly that many years and he had an assignment for you, what would that do your, to your confidence? What would that do to your mindset? And then it would make you confident. It would make you um, um, less anxious. I mean, bad things went on. And we look at, for instance, the life of Daniel um, um, as he was positioned by God to infiltrate the Babylonian hierarchy and the kings and the leaders, giving him interpretations of dreams. And um, they saw kings raised up and put down, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thrown into the um, uh, fiery furnace and, and God being glorified uh, right there. A party going on later on with all of the, all of the, um, um, all of the officials of the land celebrating and drinking and, and debauching and doing all kinds of evil, bad stuff. And all of a sudden, handwriting on the wall. 
handwriting on the wall, God saying, I have numbered your days. Your days are numbered. God kept showing them and telling them, I have a plan. I'm in control. Don't get anxious. Be a part of my plan. That is his message to you today. Whatever trial you're going through, whatever difficulty you're going through, whether your life is going to find a, a completion in the years before he returns, you are part of his story, and he is in charge, and he is writing a story from which you are a sentence, you are a paragraph, you are a chapter, you are part of the book of the history that God is writing. There's an interesting thing in the New Testament where someone was sick and the disciples came to Jesus and said, why is this person sick? Is it because of the sin of their mother? Is it because of the sin of their dad? We want to figure that stuff out. Amen? We want to figure out why this happens and why that happens. And Did someone do something wrong? Did I do something wrong? And the answer of Jesus was, no, but this is so that God can receive glory. He can receive praise. He can receive acclamation. And I pondered that. I wonder, how does God receive glory and praise over difficult situations? And someone might say, well, yeah, when they get healed, then we can praise God. But how many of you know that not everybody gets healed and not everybody is getting healed? I still believe it's God's will. And I think it's a little bit of a cop-out to say, oh, I'm not healed now, but I'll be, I'll be healed in the great by and by so his promise is, is uh, uh, fulfilled. I think we need to press in, uh, press in and ask God about our healing until we get, I'm not going to say healing, but until we get an answer. An answer that will sustain you in the middle of that, not just sickness, but in the middle of that trial, in the middle of that difficulty, in the middle of, of the things that are going on. And so Jesus says, not, uh, ne neither one's fault, but so that God can receive glory. And I pondered that and I thought, you know what? Um, I preached a funeral one time about a lady. Um, I'd been at a church for, at that church for about 15 years. And the whole 15 years that I'd been there, this sweet lady had been in the um, rest home and she had um, Alzheimer's. She didn't know who she was. She didn't know who anybody else was. And it occurred to me when I preached her funeral, because that's the only way I knew her, except for by stories of other people. But it occurred to me as I thought about that, and the Holy Spirit, I believe, spoke to me. And, and, and said, and I thought, how does God receive glory from something like that? And you know how God receives glory from difficult situations? All the people that cared for her were glorious to God. All the people that showed love to someone who couldn't show love back brought glory to God. Do you know that when you're in the midst of a trial and a difficult situation and you don't know the end from the beginning and you don't know the answer, but you say, I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know how this is going to be. But I praise God that God receives glory from that. God, just, God doesn't receive glory just when things go right, just when the check gets there, just when the time is right and, and a person gets healed. But God receives glory when you're in the middle of the trial and you are giving God praise. That's how God receives glory right there. Now, I'm not suggesting that you give up on pressing in for an answer to your need. I think you should. I think we need to. I think God calls us to do that. But it, that gives God glory, too, when we don't give up. So number one, remember the, be, remember the, the beginning from the end, that in the, in the bookends of the story that God has written, he's in, you know what this does for me? I'll just say on the political scene today, it makes me stop getting all worked up. It makes me stop worrying about who's going to do what and what's going to happen. I still care about my country. I still care about things that are going to happen. But it makes me stop fretting and getting anxious and getting excited. Why? Because God's writing his story. God's writing his story with every single president that comes into office. God's writing his story. And so when it starts to get too much, when, you, when you're on uh, Facebook or when you're twittering your fingers away, um, um, Step back and say, God, this is an amazing story that's going on. I want to see you in the middle of it and give God praise in the middle of it. So number one, in this day, 
where we're advancing the kingdom of God, the number one thing to remember is that this is God's story and he's writing it. Amen? Amen. Number two, expect resistance. When you got saved, the ideal might have been for the guy when, when, or the woman, the person when they were baptizing you, to hold you under <laughs> until breath was out of you and send you right on to heaven. But they didn't do that. Instead, they left you here. And the word says, in this world, you will have tribulation. It's one of the promises of Jesus. In this world, you'll have tribulation. Do you know what that tribulation is for? Because resistance to your purposes brings out your story. Resistance to God's purposes in your life tests the reality of God in your life. The resistance that comes into your life as you are a husband, a wife, a father, a mother, a student, a business owner, um, a politician, uh, whatever you are, bring strength and purification and the completion of God in you as he's working his purposes in you. That's what the resistance is for. My um, grandson Samuel is into weightlifting right now. He wants to get strong and be a good football player. He's a shot putter and he's a discus thrower. And I'm just tickled at how he's just gotten interested in. He goes to the Y by himself and he lifts weights and he's got weightlifting buddies and he's just really into that now. I, 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 like, the, I like the exercise videotapes <laughs> or CDs, videotapes, <laughs> CDs. It's been a while since I've had one. Where you sit on the couch and you put them in and you watch them. That's what I like. Resistance is hard. But it's resistance that makes strength. Resistance in personalities. Resistance in conversations. Resistance in business. Nobody, nobody says, oh, I, I just love it today. It was such a difficult day. But it's in that resistance as you apply the strength that God gives you, as you apply the purposes of God in your life and through your life, that you are built up, that you are strengthened in character, that you are strengthened in mind, that you are strengthened in all the ways God wants you to be strengthened as you yield your life to him. You can yield your life another way and get all bitter and ugly and icky, but if you yield your life to God and you apply those things to God, then that's how his improvement comes into your life. You know, for a lot of Christians today, the first sign of inconvenience tempts them to despair. The first sign of inconvenience, and I, I'll confess that in my life, in my life, you know, I, I think with most people's lives, you have moments like that. Mine is I-90 when it's down to one lane. It tempts me to despair. It just does. When traffic stops on the interstate, that can't be God's will. But anyway, trials and difficulties, we face them. And there are some Christians, they, they've memorized Romans 8.28, and they say, and we know that all things work together for my good because I'm called of God and called according to his purpose. And they, and they think it wrong and they say it wrong. So I'm here to correct it today. It says, and we know that all things work together for good. Not my convenience, not my comfort, not my, my entertainment. All things work together for not even my good. Not even my good. And you know how scriptural that is? Because the apostles, except for one or two, all were martyred. Now, I'm pretty sure that's not according to their good. But it's according to the good of God and his story and the purposes of God. All things work together for good for those who love God to those who are called together for his purpose. Here's the thing, and this is how you frame it. 
When you surrendered to God, you became his. And your foundational purposes became his highest purposes. And so your purposes come in behind that. And you yield them all. The best thing about God is that that's what brings us our greatest joy is when we yield to his purposes and make his purposes our purposes. So, number one, keep the, keep the end in sight. Number two, expect resistance. Number three, take opportunity. You, you know, there's preparation and when you have opportunity to prepare school or ministry or life or whatever, take that. Those are opportunities. Timothy 4.2, Paul was writing to a young pastor. He says, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all patience and teaching. Be ready. And in Babylon, uh, we see Daniel challenging the diet of the palace when he first gets in there. Here's what you're going to eat. And he says, no, we can't. I'm sorry. He was respectful. He says, I'm sorry, we can't eat that. And so he got favor from God and he worked out a thing with the servant of, of the, the king of the a land. And he said, well, we'll try you on this other diet for a season and we'll do these others who haven't refused this on this other diet. And we'll see who is doing better after a certain amount of time. And he saw that they were doing better after a certain amount of time. That was the first opportunity that Daniel had to stand up and confess what he believed. He took that opportunity. The next time was when the king had a dream and, and Daniel was known as one who could interpret dreams. Another time was being available to testify of God's truth and reality when called upon, back to resistance, it gained him the jealousy of all of the counselors of the king and they plotted to kill him and they threw him in a den of lions and God protected him. But in our lives, if you want to know what you should do next for God, take the next opportunity. If you want to, if you want to know what, what step you should take next, what opportunity is in front of you and what presents itself. You know, <clears throat> let me insert this here in, in several other places. It would really be good to pray. Not on your knees for hours and hours. I heard, I heard a quote this week on the radio that, that this um, praying individual said, I never pray longer than 20 minutes. I never pray longer than 20 minutes. He said, but I never go longer than 20 minutes without praying. And if you develop a life where you're talking to God, he's going to show you what to do. He's going to answer. And if he's not telling you what to do, don't worry about it. He's not going to do turn right, turn left, turn right, turn left, unless you ask for that at the moment. And sometimes he doesn't to test your faith. But you get involved with God in this conversational life with God, and then you take the opportunity that he puts before you. You know, for us, we can take a lesson from Daniel and stay in communion with God through prayer. To be in the right place at the right time, to carefully carry out our assignment as mothers, fathers, husbands, wives, workers, soldiers, caregivers, caregivers and ministers. Not something else, not something that looks bigger, but what you're doing right now. Well, Pastor, I'm unemployed right now. Praise God. How many unemployed, how many people that you come in contact every day need, need encouragement and strength and the kingdom of God brought into their life? Every avenue, every place, every nook, every cranny, whatever those are. Let me say something here, insert something. We have a culture where uh, everything is awesome, to quote the, the movie, what's that? Lego movie, everything is awesome. Everything is awesome. Everything has to be great. And, and it, it puts about 98% of us in a place where we feel like failures because we're not great, except for those of us who are old enough to not care anymore and know that it's all right. Don, <laughs> I'm not picking on you or anything, but I, I, let, me, let me see if I can just briefly explain this. Uh, king Saul was chosen. He was good looking. He was handsome. He was tall. They wanted a king. So they chose <clears throat> King Saul. And God gave him a, a super opportunity to lead the people and to be their king. But Saul had some character defects, he had some insecurities, he had, he had some things that a lot of us have. 
But Saul had been placed in this place, and so he decided he wanted to be great. And so when God didn't show up when he was supposed to, or when he thought he was going to show up, or when Saul, Samuel, I mean, didn't come when he was supposed to, Saul stepped into a place because he feared the opinion of the people and sacrifice to God and disobedience to God because Saul wanted to be great. Let me just slip that in there. Because Saul didn't want to be embarrassed because he was the king, so he felt like he had to act like the king. And Samuel came to him and said, he said, no, I've offered, I've saved all the best to offer it up and give it to God. Seems noble, seems great. But Samuel said to him, no, Saul, here's the thing. God prefers obedience to sacrifice. God, and I'm not talking about the sacrifice that you make every day as a mom or you make every day as a business leader or something like that. But I'm talking about the sacrifices that he offered up of, of something awesome and great or whatever. It's, it's awesome and it's, it's necessary that you strive to be the best that you can be. But when you make greatness your goal, to be great, you put yourself on a path of danger and temptation and difficulty. I just wanted to slip that in there. So, go, so be great, but don't seek greatness. Do you all understand? If you understand what I'm saying, say amen. Okay, because pride sneaks in and it gets in and then you lose sight of what God wants for you. But take opportunity. Finally, live by faith. That's number four. Daniel couldn't see all that God had in mind for him and Daniel saw more than most. But for you and me, know you're part of a plan. And I just feel, I feel like I have to stress this. A lot of you think, you look at someone you admire and you think, yeah, I know they're part of God's plan. But I'm telling every one of you, from kid to baby to adult to senior, know that you are a part of God's plan. Not if you do something greater or something different or something better, but right stinking now. Right now. You're part of God's story. You're part of his plan. You're part of the faithfulness of God. He's writing his story of salvation with you as a part of the narrative. And the chapter he's writing is about you and your circle and you and your circle and you and your circle in all of these areas. And your patient sacrifice and your patient obedience and your faith will be included in the text of eternity. I keep hearing this. I keep hearing this as though you're saying it out loud. He's not talking to me. That's not me. I am talking to you. You who are thinking that. I'm talking exactly. To, I'm not talking to these people here who think they're great and know they're wonderful and know they're accomplishing things for God. I am talking to you. You, taking care of um, ankle biters and, and going to your job every day and, and, and working on an assembly line and, and loading trucks and, and cutting grass and cooking meals and cleaning houses. I'm talking to you. You are part of God's amazing plan. And as you embrace that, and as you accept that, you will begin to see the works of God begin to shoot and grow and blossom from your life. Part of the fact that you're not seeing that is because you don't believe it's true. And you will begin to see it. You'll get saved all over again. It'll be wonderful in your life. That'll be powerful. Artina, if you'll come. Pastor Jake, if you'll come up too. I want to I want to read a scripture to close out here. It's in 1 Peter chapter 1. And Peter wrote uh, the letter of 1 Peter and 2 Peter. He wrote to the church that was under great trial and under great difficulty. We have a crazy world we live in. I don't know, you know, I I I enjoy seeing um, um, people of all different groups and faiths. I've got a friend who's a Methodist pastor who's the Methodist church is doing battle right now over what they're going to believe and what they're going to do. Catholics, I love Catholics who are believers and love God and love Jesus and, 
and um, Muslims all over the world are having visions of Jesus Christ and Muslims are coming to Christ um, uh, in, in um, great numbers in that antichrist religion. That antichrist religion. Islam is an antichrist religion. They don't embrace Jesus as the sacrifice of God, as the Son of God. And I read and hear the news where the, the Pope is chumming with the mullahs and they're figuring out how to be buddies and that they all believe the same things. And, and I see the world just the way it is and, and crazy. And the devil wants me to be anxious and he wants me to be worried. But here's the thing. I'm Daniel in Babylon and I know that in 62 more years, God's going to bring this to a close. And I'm Steve in 2019 that knows I'm going to live my life and I'm going to be obedient to God and my story is going to be part of the narrative, the book that God is writing and that He's going to bring it to an end. And, and at that end, every knee, not just knee, the knee, knees of believers, but every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. That's, so, so here I am. I'm confident now. I'm calm. Even when it's crazy around me. I'm calm. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of who's going to be elected next. I'm uncomfortable, but I'm not afraid. 1 Peter 1, 6 through 9, it says this. With my bifoculars, let me get this. He says, in this, uh, let me start a little earlier. Let me, let me start with verse 3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has uh, caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. To an inheritance, something that is saved for us. This inheritance is incorruptible and undefiled. It doesn't fade away. It's reserved in heaven for you. You who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. <clears throat> in this, you and I greatly rejoice Though now for a little while, if need be, we're grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise, the honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice, with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Ho! Oh, mom, dad, daughter, son, grandma, grandpa, and everything in between. You are part of his story that he's writing. Keep the end in sight. Expect resistance. Take every opportunity and live by faith. That's how we'll advance the kingdom of God in this world. Wasn't that great? I, I, I want to close um, real quick by doing a couple of things here. Um, maybe you're here this morning and... Um, you heard what, what Pastor Steve said. I, I just love that word. I, I love that he used the analogy of the writing of the story because, to be honest with you, I, I think that there's some here that, that maybe God wants to start a new chapter in your life. God wants to start a new story in your life. Maybe you've been in a place before where you're going, you know what, Pastor, I, I, I look back at what's been written about me, and I don't really like it at all. Like, there's a lot of bad stuff going on back there. The Bible promises us that when we come to Jesus, that he makes us brand new. Behold, all things have passed away, and everything becomes new. It's like the slate's clean, the page is wiped, and it is, it is, it is, you just start over in your own personal life. And maybe you're here here this morning, and you're saying, you know what, Pastor, I, I want to start a new chapter. I want to start a new page. I, I, I see what's back there, but I want to start something new. Man, God is here for you. Amen? 
For those of you that have made a commitment before to Jesus Christ, by a show of hands real quick, how many of you say that is the best decision you've ever made in your lifetime? Yeah, look at this. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Oh, pastor, I don't want to live by a bunch of rules and a bunch of regulations. Let me tell you, there's so much freedom with Jesus. Right now, you're more bound than you think you are so much freedom in Christ. So what I'd like for us to do here as we close is I want you to bow your head and close your eyes with me. And just, just so we can have this kind of be a, a sacred moment, if you will, and what I'd like to do is I'd like to ask you the question, if there's anybody here this morning that says, Pastor, I want to start a new chapter in my life. I want to start fresh. I want, the, I, want, I want the pages to be, I want the old past pages to be ripped out. I want to start a new book, if you will, a new story. If that's you, will you just raise your hand real quick and put it right back down? There's one, awesome. There's two, there's three. Anybody else says to me, Pastor? There's four. Come on, somebody. Is there anybody else that says to me, Pastor, pray for me? Pray for me. There's five, six. Thank you so much. Anybody else that says, that's me, Pastor? Oh, that's so great, guys. Come on, church. Six people this morning says, that's me. Now, I'm going to give you a template prayer in the form of a poem called the Salvation Poem. And I'm going to talk real briefly about this, I promise you. What I'd like for you to do is everyone together, if you can just repeat this after me. Now, this poem and this prayer does not save you. What matters is, is if your connection with God, if you mean it within your heart, you say, this is, this is what I really want, God. This is going to start the new chapter in your life right now, okay? So if you can, repeat this after me. Say, Jesus, you died upon a cross and rose again to save the lost. Forgive me now of all my sin. Come be my savior, Lord and friend. Change my life and make it new and help me, Lord, to live for you. As easy as that, the page is clean now in your life. You are a new believer in Christ. Come on, let's give it up for Jesus, yeah. Now, we're talking about the kingdom being in our lives. I, I want to encourage you, write out these welcome, uh, right on the welcome center right out here. We've got these salvation poem cards, okay, that we would love to put in your hand. And I, I want to challenge you to take three today, if you can, and let's go change someone's life. Amen? Let's go change someone's life. On the front, it gives the salvation poem with a picture of, uh, uh, of that really awesome, s s astonishing Hispanic guy. Uh, and 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 then and then then it has a salvation poem. That's me, by the way. If you didn't know that, and 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 underneath, right, it has a salvation poem. Now on the back, this is where it gets really great. They get to put their name on that card that they said the prayer, right? They said the prayer. A couple of the great ways for us to do this is you, you take it to a uh, when you go out to the restaurant here in a little bit, right? You 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 get out a a really nice awesome tip for your waiter or waitress, right? Roll that up in this and you put it on the table, right? You just leave it on the table. Now, if you get a little bit more bold about it, you kind of say, hey, I'd love to have a conversation with you. Can we have a conversation about Jesus? you have any questions? I'd love to talk with you about it. And then the next step would be if you get just a little bit more bold and say, can I, can I pray this salvation poem with you? Can we write your name on the back? I'd love to connect with you and invite you to church to come be a part of the new story that Jesus has for you. Amen. So why don't we do that? Why don't we take three of these cards, if you will, right on the Welcome Center, and let's go pass them out this week. Let's bring the kingdom of God into someone's life this morning. Amen? Man, you guys are awesome. You guys are great. Even though we just talked about greatness, you guys really are great. All right, why don't we go ahead and stand? Let's close today. Father, we love you so much today, Jesus. You're so powerful in our hearts and our lives. God, we thank you for your love. So extravagant for us, Jesus. We thank you for your love. If you